Welcome back Scouts for Activity 13, Setting Up Tents, Tying Knots, and Marble Games. Hemp Hill, Camino Real, Blanco Vista Elementary, and all others are welcome. For more fun activities at home, visit our YouTube channel, Sacred Springs Scout Reach. Please join me in the Scout Oath. On my honor, I will do my best to do my duty to God and my country and to obey the Scout law, to help other people at all times, to keep myself physically strong, mentally awake, and morally straight. Please join me in the Scout law. A Scout is trustworthy, loyal, helpful, friendly, courteous, kind, obedient, cheerful, thrifty, brave, clean, and reverent. The scout is loyal. The scout is true to his family, friends, scout leaders, school, and nation. The scout is loyal. Show the Cub Scout sign. Tell what it means. Make the sign with your right hand. Hold your arm straight up. The two raised fingers stand for the Scout Oath and the Scout Law. The fingers look like the sharp ears of the wolf, ready to listen to a Kayla. Remember that a Kayla means good leader to a Cub Scout. Your mother or father or guardian is a Kayla. So is your Cub Master or your Den Leader. At school, your teacher is a Kayla. Say the Cub Scout motto, tell what it means. The Cub Scout motto is do your best. A motto is a guiding principle and a rule for living. Do your best means trying your hardest, not just a little bit. Do your best all the time. Do your best in school and at home. Do your best when you play a game and help your team. Do your best as you work on your rank adventures. Requirement three, make a list of items you should take along on your camp out. Being comfortable in the outdoors means taking along the right gear to keep you warm, dry, and safe. You don't need all the comforts of home, but a few key things can really help you enjoy your camp out. Make a list of personal items you should bring along on your camp out, including your Cub Scout 6 Essentials. You should take them on every outing. If you need help making your list your den leader, may have some ideas to help out. Cub Scout Six Essentials First Aid Kit Filled Water Bottle Flashlight Trail Food Sun Protection Whistle The Scout Basic Essentials Things You Should Take on Every Outing First Aid Kit Extra Clothing Rain Gear Filled Water Bottle Pocket Knife if you've earned your whittling chip, flashlight, trail food, sun protection, map, and compass. As a Boy Scout, you can earn your firearm chip. That will allow you to carry matches and a fire starter, overnight gear, tent or tarp, poles and stakes, ground cloth, sleeping bag, pillow, air mattress or pad, warm jacket, sweatshirt, try to avoid cotton, sweatpants, for sleeping, try to avoid cotton, cup, bowl, knife, fork, spoon, mesh bag, insect repellent, extra clothing, toothpaste, toothbrush, soap, washcloth, towel, comb, Weebelow's scout uniform, durable shoes slash boots depending on weather hat or cap, optional items, camera, binoculars, missile, sunglasses, fishing gear, notebook and pencil, nature books, swimsuit, bath towel, Bible, testament, prayer book, or other book for your faith. Requirement one. With the help of your den leader or family, plan and conduct a camp out. If you went camping when you were younger, your parents or other adults may have done all the planning. 
As a Weevil Oak Scout, you get to help plan your own adventures. Work with your den leader or another adult in charge of your camp out to help plan it. Pick a location and date and make a list of activities that you could do on the camp out. And you can camp in your own backyard. On one of my Weeblos campouts, we saw some deer grazing near a lake after they left. Our den leader showed us how to make plaster casts of their hoof prints. I still have the one I made. Requirement four, make a list of equipment that the group should bring along in addition to each scout's personal gear. Besides your personal gear, you will need some other items that the whole group will use. With your den or family, make a list of some items below. Your leader will make sure these items are at the camp out for the group to use. You can camp out in your own backyard. Requirement seven, help set up a tent. Pick a good spot for the tent and explain to your den leader why you picked it. Where you put up your tent is an important part of being comfortable on a camp out. Your tent should be in a flat area that is clear of any low spots where water will collect if it rains. It should also be sheltered from strong winds. During cold weather, try to face the door of your tent away from the wind. Before you put up your tent, move any rocks, sticks, or other hard objects from the tent site. They can hurt bare feet and damage the bottom of your tent. After you take down the tent, put back the objects you moved near where you found them. Also, pick up anything you and the other campers brought to the campsite. Scouts always leave no trace. Requirement two, on arrival at the campout with your den and den leader or family, determine where to set up your tent. Demonstrate knowledge of what makes a good tent site and what makes a bad one. Set up your tent without help from an adult. A scout is helpful. Setting up tent is easier and more fun when you work together as a team. Taking care of your tent. Your tent will last for years if you take care of it. Remember that a scout is thrifty. Here are some tips. Always pitch it on a ground cloth which is a sheet of plastic or tarp that protects the floor from dirt, sharp objects, and moisture. Fold the corners of the tarp under the tent so the ground cloth is no bigger than the tent. Otherwise, rain can get in between. Don't wear your shoes inside. Keep tent vents open to let moisture escape. Keep all flames away from tents. Never use candles, matches, stoves, heaters, or lanterns in or near a tent. No tent is fireproof. All tents can burn or melt when exposed to heat. Let the tent dry in the sun before you take it down. If you have to pack it up wet, set it up again as soon as you get home or hang it indoors until it dries completely. That will prevent mildew from ruining the fabric and making it stink. Hi there, Scouts. Today we're going to learn how to set up a tent. You're going to need your tent and a tarp or a ground cloth. Your tent may be a little different from this one here, but most tents are going to come with a tent, poles, sticks, and a rain fly. The first thing we need to do is decide where to set up the tent. The spot you choose should be high and dry, as well as level. Be sure there are no sticks or branches underneath your tent. Clear that all the way before you begin to set up. Don't pitch your tent in a ditch or you'll have a very wet camping trip. Also, do not set up underneath a tree. Falling branches can cause injury. Once you have the perfect spot, go ahead and lay the tarp down flat. This is going to protect the bottom of the tent as well as help keep it clean. 
Now we're going to unroll the tent and lay it on top of the tarp. Take a note of where the door is and put it in the direction you would like it facing. Now it's time to assemble the tent poles. Now take the first pole and slide it through the sleeve on the tent. Be careful of the metal end and guide it carefully so you don't rip the tent. Once the end comes out of the first sleeve, slide it through the next sleeve right across from it. Repeat this process with the second pole and afterwards you should have this X in the center of the tent. Let's direct our attention to the end of the poles. On the tent, you see this small pin, you're going to insert that into the end of the pole. Once all four corners have pins inserted, the tent will be standing like this. Now insert the stakes in all four corners. Be sure to pull it tight or your tent will leak. Your tent may also have these clips that snap onto the poles. Just snap them on the tent poles and that will help pull the fabric up. Now we need to attach the rain fly to the tent. Use the Velcro loops on the underside of the rain fly to attach it to the poles. All four corners of the rain fly will have these hooks. Attach them at the bottom of each tent pole by the stakes. This rain fly has a pole that slides through the sleeve and then the ends go into the clips on the tent. Now just stake down the guide line for the rain fly and you're all set. This line is adjustable to keep the rain fly tight so no water leaks through. And there we have it, our tent is all set up. Requirement 3. Once your tents are set up, discuss with your den what actions you should take in the case of the following extreme weather events, which could require you to evacuate. A. Severe rainstorm causing flooding. B. Severe thunderstorm with lightning or tornadoes. C. Fire, earthquake, or other disaster that will require evacuation. Discuss what you have done to minimize as much danger as possible. On most campouts, the worst weather you'll see is rain and annoying heat or cold. Sometimes, however, the weather can be dangerous. It's important to be prepared. That's the scout motto for bad situations. Severe rain and flooding. Flash floods can occur when there's very heavy rain over several hours or steady rain over several days. Because splash floods can strike with little warning, you should never camp on low ground next to streams when rain is expected. When you're camping in the mountains, be aware of the weather upstream from your campsite. Heavy rain miles away can turn into flash floods downstream. If flooding occurs, move to higher ground immediately. Stay out of streams, ditches, and other flooding areas. Adults should never try to drive through floodwaters, no matter how shallow they may seem. Just a few inches of water can carry off a car. To get a rough idea of how far away a storm is, count the number of seconds between when you see lightning and hear thunder. Divide by five to get the number of miles. Severe thunderstorms, lightning, and tornadoes. Thunderstorms can be loud and scary. Sometimes they produce dangerous lightning and tornadoes. Lightning can strike 10 miles from a thunderstorm, so you should take shelter in a building or vehicle as soon as you hear thunder, even if the sun is shining overhead. Make sure you're not the highest object in the area and avoid water, open areas, isolated trees, picnic shelters, and metal objects. If you're caught in the open, spread out 100 feet apart and crouch down like you do when you play leapfrog. Tornadoes are funnel clouds that can form in spring and summer thunderstorms. The best place to be if a tornado hits is indoors, either in a basement or closet or against an interior wall. 
if you're caught outside, get in a ditch and lie as flat as possible. The National Weather Service issues watches when conditions are right for severe weather and warnings when severe weather is occurring. Your leader can carry a portable weather radio or use a mobile phone application to receive information about watches, warnings, and forecasts for your area. Fires, earthquakes, and other disasters. In very rare cases, such as if there's a forest fire, you may have to evacuate your campsite. Your leader will tell the den where to meet, take attendance, and move the group to safety. Staying found. Anyone can get lost, even adults. But you can do some things to avoid getting lost and to stay safe if you do get lost. Always stay with a buddy. Let an adult know if you and your buddy need to leave the group and tell where you're going. Carry a whistle to signal for help. Three blasts in a row is the universal distress call. If you think you are lost, remember to stop. Stay where you are and stay calm. Think about how you can help others searching for you. Observe your surroundings and watch for searchers. Plan how to stay warm and dry until help arrives. Requirement 2. Show how to tie an overhand knot and a square knot. Tying knots is an important scout skill. It is also something you will use throughout your life. Some of the knots you will learn in scouts have been used for thousands of years. Every knot has a special purpose. Some knots join pieces of rope together. Some knots that don't slip are used for rescue. Other knots are perfect for tying down equipment. You can adjust these knots and they will still hold. Overhand knot. An overhand knot is simple. You can use it to keep a rope from going through a pulley, a hole, or to make a rope easier to grip. An overhand knot is also the first step for some other knots. You will need a single strand of rope to practice this knot. First, make a loop in the end of a rope. Next, tuck the end of the rope through the loop. Pull the end of the rope to tighten the knot. Hint, do you need a larger knot to stop a rope from going through a big hole? You can make a larger stopper knot by adding a second overhand knot after the first one. Square knot. The main use of a square knot is to join the ends of two ropes. This is why it is called the joining knot in scouting. You can use both ends of one piece of rope to make a square knot or two different colored pieces of rope. Number one, hold one end of a rope in one hand and the other end of the rope in your other hand or hold a different colored rope in each hand. Number two, bring the right side rope over the left side rope. Go under and around the left side rope with the right side rope. Number three. Now bring the left side rope over the right side rope. Go under and around the right side rope with the left side rope. Number four. Pull both ends firmly. The knot will not hold its shape without being tightened. More square knot. Practice until you get it. Requirement five for Weeblos is to do the following. Show how to tie a square knot, two half hitches, and a taut line hitch. Explain how each knot is used. Show the proper care of a rope by learning how to whip and fuse the ends of different kinds of rope. Square knot. The square knot has many uses from securing packages and the sails of ships to tying the ends of bandages. It is called a joining knot because it joins together two ropes and because it is the knot you learn when you become a Boy Scout. You may also recognize it as part of the World Crest Badge that you already wear on your uniform. So first step, hold a rope end in each hand. Two, pass the right end over and under the rope in your left hand. Three, Pass the rope in now in your left hand, over and under the one now in your right hand. Four, pull the knot snug. 
Remember, right over left, left over right. If you go right over left and then right over left again, you'll end up with a granny knot, which is not very secure. So remember, right over left, left over right. And practice until the knot looks like the square. Two half hitches. A hitch is a knot that ties a rope to something. Use two half hitches when you want to tie a rope, called a guy line, to a tent or dining fly. The knot will slide down easily to secure the rope. First step, pass the end of the rope through the grommet or around the post. Two, bring the end over and under the body of the rope, known as the standing part. Then back through the loop that has formed, this makes a half hitch. Three, take the end around the standing part a second time and tie another half hitch. Four, pull the knot snug. Top line hitch. A top line hitch is similar to two half hitches, but it creates a loop that doesn't slide. Use it to attach the guy line on your tent or dining fly to a stake in the ground. You can easily adjust it to tighten the rope. Taut is another word for tight. First, pass the end of the rope around the tent stake. Second, bring the end under and over the standing part of the line to form a loop, then twice through the loop. Three, again, bring the rope end under, over, and through a loop, but this time farther up the standing part. Four, work any slack out of the knot. Five, slide the hitch to tighten or loosen the rope. And remember to have fun. Whipping and fusing rope. As you use rope, the ends can become frayed. To make the ends more durable, you can whip them if the rope is made of natural fibers like sisal or fuse them if they are made out of synthetic material like nylon. Whipping rope. Cut off the part of the rope that is already unraveled. Cut a piece of strong string, dental floss, or a thin twine, at least 8 to 10 inches long. Make a bite or loop and place it on one end of the rope. Wrap the string tightly around the rope several times. When the whipping is as wide as the rope is thick, slip the end through the loop, then pull both string ends hard and cut them off. Fusing rope. Rope and cord made from plastic or nylon will melt when exposed to high heat. Cut away the frayed part of the rope, then working in a well-ventilated area, hold each end a few inches above a lighted match or candle to melt and fuse the strands together. Melted rope is hot and sticky, so don't touch the end until it is completely cool. And be sure and get mom and dad to help. Requirement 8. Demonstrate how to tie two half hitches and explain what the hitch is used for. Every knot has a specific use. The two half hitches knot is used to tie items to a post or tree trunk. The knot is easy to untie when you are ready, but it will hold tight while in use. Each wrap around the rope is called a half hitch. Making two of them around the rope is what gives this hitch its name. Tie a rope to a tree or post using two half hitches, then pull hard. Did the knot hold? Now stop pulling and see how easy it is to untie. Just push the free end of the rope back through and the knot is untied. Requirement 5 Show how to tie a bowline. Explain when this knot should be used and why. Teach it to another scout who is not a Weeblo scout. A bowline is a very useful knot to learn. It makes a fixed loop in a rope that will not slip, unlike a taut line hitch or two half hitches. The bowline can be used to anchor one end of the rope to a tree or other stationary object 
or as the loop around the person's chest in a rescue situation, such as pulling a person out of a hole or off the side of a cliff. Number one, make a small overhand loop in the standing part of the rope. Number two, bring the rope end through the loop, around behind the standing part, and back down into the loop. Number three, tighten the bowline by pulling the standing part of the rope away from the loop. Once you've mastered the bowline, teach it to a younger Cub Scout. Learn a magic rope trick. Fold your arms across your chest. Lean forward and pick up one end of the rope in each hand. Unfold your arms and you have tied an overhand knot. Hello Scouts, we are here in Columbus, Ohio. I'd like to introduce Miguel, Nagy, Vanessa, and I'm Patrick. They're going to help us with our adventure today. First, we're going to make a lion bag to organize and store our gear. Why would I need a bag for scouting? Can I just throw my stuff in my backpack? You can, but the lion bag makes everything neat and keeps us from losing things. To make a lion bag, you'll need a hanger, scissors, hot glue or fa fabric glue, felt or other fabric, and an adult to help you. First, you'll cut up the material so that it's long enough to hang on the hanger and can fold over to make a couple pockets. Next, we'll use our fabric glue or hot glue to make two pockets on the front by putting hot glue down the middle of the material. For the last step, you'll use your glue to make side seams on the outsides of your pockets. Then you can add decorations if you want, like patches of glitter and don't forget your name. Once the glue has dried, add all of your scouting stuff to the pockets and hang your shirt on the hanger. A personal care check checklist is a list of things you can do for yourself without being told. Here are some examples of the things you put on a personal care checklist. Brushing your teeth, putting toys away, reading, taking a bath. Write down your own list and try a few of the activities on your list each day. As scouts, we're tr always trying to do what's best for ourselves and for others. Make sure you're taking good care of yourself because there's only one. Sometimes we wear shoes that don't need to be tied, like sandals. But other times we wear shoes with laces, like sneakers and boots. It's important that you tie your shoes so you don't trip and fall. It's a tough thing to learn, but practice will make it super easy. We're going to show you how to tie a shoelace. You can practice along with us. We are, there are a lot of different ways people tie their shoes. So today we're going to show you just show you one way. First you make an overhand knot, then fold each end of the lace into a single bunny ear. You can hold the ears in place between your thumb and pointer finger on each hand. Cross the bunny ears so that they form an X in the air. Lift the bottom bunny ear over and through the top bunny ear. This will create a second knot. Pull the bunny ears out this side away from the shoe. This will create a square knot that will hold the shoe in place. This is the end of our adventure. Thank you for spending some time with us today. I hope you had fun. Remember to always do your best. Goodbye, everybody. Marble Madness, snapshot of adventure. Long before there were board games and video games, kids played with marbles. Those little balls of glass are just as fun to play with now as they were back then. In this adventure, you'll get to play several different marble games including one you make up for yourself. You'll also learn some special words only marble players know, 
and discover how to use marbles in mazes, obstacle courses, and more. Are you ready? Then grab your taws, aggies, and cat's eyes, and let's play marbles. Requirement one, discuss with your family and den the history of marbles, such as where and when the game began. Talk about the different sizes of marbles and what they are made of and used for. Did you know that marbles have been around for a long time? Your grandparents may have played marbles. Their grandparents may have played marbles. And their grandparents may have played marbles. In fact, marbles have been found in Egyptian tombs and in Pueblo ruins in the southwestern United States. No one knows for sure where and when people started playing marbles. They may have started at different times and places by playing with stones, nuts, fruit pits, and other smooth, round objects. Here are some fun facts about marbles. When he was young, the Roman Emperor Augustus played with marbles made of nuts. In 1503, the town of Nuremberg, Germany, passed a law that marbles had to be played outside the town limits. In the 1700s, people played using chips of marble, which is where the game got its name. In the early 1900s, marbles were made by machine for the first time. The British and the World Marbles Championship has been played in Tinsley Green, England, every year since 1932, but the tradition began there in 1588. Marbles come in many different sizes and colors, and they are used for different things. Larger marbles are used as shooters, while smaller marbles are used as targets. Here are some types of marbles. Cat's eye marbles have a swirl of color inside. Taw marbles are between one half inch and three fourths of an inch in diameter, and they are used as shooters. Alley marbles are made of alabaster or marble. Some are made of glass that looks like alabaster. Or marble. Aggie marbles are made of the mineral agate. Some are made of glass but look like agate. True aggies are good shooters because they are harder than other marbles. Kami or common marbles were originally made out of clay and they are the plainest looking marbles. Requirement two. Learn about three different marble games and learn to play the marble game Ringer. Learn how to keep score, learn and follow the rules of the game, play the game with your family, friends, or your den. There are many different games of marble, and each game has its own set of rules and directions. Here are three games to try. The first is Ringer. Any number of players can play this game. Draw a ring on the ground about 10 feet across. Put 13 marbles in the middle of the ring, arranged in an X shape. They should be about three inches apart. The first player kneels outside the ring and uses his shooter to try to shoot a marble out of the ring. If he misses, his turn is over and he picks up his shooter. If he has a hit and his shooter stays in the ring, he can shoot again from where the shooter stopped. If he has a hit and his shooter goes out of the ring, his turn is over. He keeps any marbles that go out of the ring. When the first player's turn is over, the second player takes his turn, etc. Keep playing until time is up or most of the marbles have been knocked down. The player with the most marbles is the winner. Have fun. The next two games will be in our next activity. Join us next time for Activity 14, Project Family Art Experience.